Okay, now I want to move to the next large part of our discussion of transcription. And so I want to talk more about promoters, this thing called pre-initiation complex, and then initiation itself. And now I'm, gonna, I'm not going to draw the DNA as a block like I did on the one. I'm going to draw it more as a double helix here, the way it might actually appear. And we still have our five prime and our three prime ends, like so. And we still have our ORF. I'm going to draw it down here a little ways, open reading frame. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about this promoter. And I want to also point out a slight error in the drawing of it this way. Um, the ORF itself would take up many different turns of the helix. I'm drawing this in a very simplistic manner, so recognize that each of these turns here um, contain a relatively small amount of DNA sequences. I just wouldn't be able to sleep tonight if I didn't point that out. All right, so let's talk about this promoter. And I want to focus on this region here. It's about minus 10 base pairs away. And it is what we often refer to as the Tata -ta box. And that's because its sequence contains a consensus sequence that is shared by, by um, other eukaryotic organisms. There can be some variations within this, but not much. And there can be some variations within this minus 10 base pairs from the start. It can be a little less, it can be a little more, but on average about minus 10 base pairs. And then down here we have another region that we'll call minus 35. And its consensus sequence is T, T, G, A, C, A. Together they make up that core promoter. That region that's going to attract transcription factors and the RNA polymerase. So that transcription can initiate. Now remember from the previous slide I mentioned that much further down in this direction, 300 or more base pairs away, or greater than 300 base pairs past the open reading frame, are these additional sequences that we call enhancer and silencer sequences. And I like to think of these as that fine-tuning control of the gene. Now, I want to point out one kind of interesting thing about these genes about any gene and that is some genes don't have these core promoters and this is something we don't often uh, often um, teach in a regular genetics class not sure why maybe we should but some genes don't have this core promoter and those genes typically so I'm gonna write genes without core promoter they don't have the ta, ta box. These typically are genes that we might call housekeeping genes. It's kind of a generic way of saying a gene that is on all of the time, all cells, or most cells. So it might be a gene specific for glycolysis or protein synthesis. One of the big questions is why? Why are these genes that, that are turned on all the time in all cells why do they not have a Tata -ta box? Well, what one explanation that, that your book provides, which is a uh, common explanation, but we don't know if it's true, is that it's much easier to initiate transcription without the Tata -ta box there. If the gene's just going to be on all the time, maybe once the RNA polymerase binds, it can continuously transcribe that gene. However, we don't really know, and we don't know why that approach has evolved. There must be some kind of an advantage to it because other genes require the Tata -ta box. Just an interesting um, side note about how these genes are typically very similar in their structure, but there are some important differences. Okay, now I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this pre-initiation complex and the transcription factors that bind to it. And if I had thought about it, I would have drawn that last figure um, a little further down because uh, I really need some space on top to to draw here. So let me uh, replicate it here real quick. Here's our ORF. Here's our minus 10. 
region and our minus 35 region. Now remember I said it's very important to have certain transcription factors bind to these regions to turn this gene on in the right cell type at the right time. And what seems to kick this off is a transcription factor that we'll call TF2D. Transcription factor for TF2 because this is um, going to recruit specifically RNA polymerase 2. And remember RNA polymerase 2 is the one that's important for messenger RNA. Now transcription factor 2D doesn't just bind to this region here. There's another protein that I'm going to put right here. And it's associated, associated with TF2D and we call this TBP, Tata binding protein. And I think your book calls it Tata box binding protein, but it, it's the same protein. And this protein is very specific, as the name might imply, to this Tata box. So it binds specifically to this region here. In doing so, it brings in TF2D. So now I want to draw that as actually binding to this region here. This association with the DNA here is not very stable. And so the next transcription factor comes along called TF2A. And TF2A, we'll just draw right here. TF2A stabilizes it and allows TF2D and TBP to be more permanently attached to this top top uh, box of the, of the core promoter. This stabilization of this complex with TF2A brings in two other proteins, two other transcription factors. I'm going to write their names here, TF2B and TF2H. I'm going to draw TF2H here and TF2B here. The exact locations on this diagram are really not all that important, but I do want to illustrate to you that it's this large mess of proteins that must bind to this region in order to make it work. And really what I'm including here is only a fraction of the transcription factors that have to bind. Now what, what I've drawn here in its simplistic form serves as a substrate or a landing platform, if you will, for RNA polymerase to bind. And I'm going to draw RNA polymerase like this, RNA polymerase 2. Now two other transcription factors that are associated with RNA polymerase 2 as it binds are TF2E and TF2F. And I'm just going to draw those right here. Again, the position for our purposes is not that important. I'm not going to ask you to draw this and make sure you draw them in the right places. Again, the idea is that it's this huge machinery that's necessary to make this whole system go. So we call this here, all the proteins we just drew here bound to this promoter, we call this the pre-initiation complex. And again, remember, I'm not showing everything here. This is just some of the ones that are involved. There are often 20 or more proteins that are needed to kind of kickstart this. But these are the main players. So how is it that we're going to move from pre-initiation pre complex to initiation and kick this RNA polymerase off the promoter and into the open reading frame so it can start transcribing this gene and making this initial RNA molecule. Well, RNA polymerase being a protein, it has an N-terminus and a C-terminus, and though I didn't draw it that way, I'm going to just kind of draw a little tail here, for lack of a better way of drawing it, and I'm going to call this the C-terminus domain. We can call it CTD for short. And what happens here is that it becomes phosphorylated. And that phosphorylation changes its shape enough so that it's released from many of these transcription factors, not all, but enough of them, where it now moves beyond the promoter and begins the initiation, which is then quickly followed by 
elongation and then termination to make ultimately our good friend the messenger RNA. Now all these transcription factors that I've just described here collectively we call all of those transcription factors general transcription factors because they are what is needed to get the general transcription machinery moving. So we call those general transcription factors. Okay, now I want to spend a little bit more time talking about some other regulatory regions of the gene. And for this description, I, I want to draw something like this, where we have our ORF here, and we have our core promoter here, that is that minus 10 and minus 30 base pair region, including the ta-ta box. And remember, we call this the distal region. I'm sorry, the distal regulatory sequences. But we also mentioned a few times that there are these regions that can be 300 or more base pairs away. And when I drew it before, I just drew one, but really, there could be several. And I, I don't have room on this board to, to draw it, but there could be some downstream of the open reading frame as well. And I said these could be enhancers or silencers. Enhancers help turn on the gene and silencers do the opposite. They help turn off. I'm gonna talk about in this, these few moments, enhancers. These proteins that bind here are quite likely different proteins. So I'm gonna draw them as different colors and different shapes, but they're all important to associate with this pre-initiation complex to enhance its expression or to enhance its stability to bring in the rest of the transcription factors necessary to make this go, to add some specificity because remember I only talked about a few of those proteins that bind here, but there's a lot more that add specificity and it could be these proteins that are at the enhancers, it could be other ones that these enhancers help um, stabilize. But the question that might pop in your head is why are they so far from the promoter? Or how do they interact? And so let's talk about how they interact first. And they do this by having the DNA, because remember that the DNA is not this very sh static structure that is unmovable. No, it can bend quite a bit. And so what happens is this whole piece of the DNA loops up. And so let's just redraw this like so, where these three sites now, these enhancer sites, are now right here. Where that red protein now is there, and this triangle is there, and the square protein is here. So they all bind to these enhancer sequences, but now by the bending of the DNA, they are now within close proximity to the pre-initiation complex. And at this position, they may interact directly. There might be some other transcription factors that are coming in here to mediate this association, but the goal is to add specificity and stabilization to this process with the goal of efficiently turning genes on in a, in a very specific manner. So that's how they do it. But why? why? Why is it that it's important that they're far apart? In fact, we know if we move these enhancer sequences or silencers, if we were talking about silencers, but we're talking about enhancers here. If we move these enhancer sequences further away or more importantly, closer, we decrease the expression of the gene. And the reason for that is if you clustered these all very close, say they were all right here, and these proteins bound here, they wouldn't have the ability or there wouldn't be the structural support to bend it and get it close to these. It would be too close to each other. It's like taking a piece of rope, and if you had the two ends of that rope, you could easily push them together. But if you take the very middle part of that rope and put both hands on it and try to bend it together, it's a little more difficult. So having them farther apart aids in the ability for the DNA to bend and bring everything in close proximity. Now I'd like to go on to a brief topic on RNA modification. If you remember, earlier I showed a piece of DNA 
and I show the RNA that was transcribed from this DNA like so I wrote it 5 prime to 3 prime and then I said it contained a mixture of exons and introns like so and I promised you we would come back to it so I'm fulfilling my promise and I'm coming back to this as we talk about RNA modification I'm going to talk about a few things about RNA modification the first is as soon as this RNA is transcribing before the point that we see here the moment that 5 prime end starts coming off the DNA on this 5 prime end it receives a modified guanine we often just refer to this as the 5 prime G cap it has a few functions it protects from deg degradation helps initiate translation and and we'll talk about splicing in a moment but it is also believed to play a role in removing this first intron another modification occurs at this end and at the three prime end what happens is we put on or our cells do rather a string of adenines and it can be hundreds of adenines that are placed there and after those adenines are placed there proteins bind to it in sort of a protective manner we call this the poly A tail like the G cap it also protects from degradation what happens is there are ooh, I wrote 5 prime my bad that should be 3 prime there are enzymes RNAs that will degrade RNA molecules from the 3 prime end by adding these adenines and these protective proteins here it delays it but once it starts degrading you don't actually get into the main part of the RNA molecule for quite some time so it helps determine the half-life of this RNA by protecting it it also assists in translation I should also mention all of these steps that I'm talking about right now occur in the nucleus before the RNA is released to the cytoplasm the next thing I want to talk about is splicing out of these introns and if you remember we talked about the small nuclear RNAs they are involved in the splicing of the introns and they form these things called SNRURP SNRPs one of my favorite words and these SNRPs will remove these introns and I'm, I don't want to go into great detail on how these introns are removed that would be a great topic for a molecular genetics class or a molecular biology class but they remove these introns so that the end result is a much smaller RNA that still has the G cap on the end and still has the poly A tail on the 3 prime end but now only consists of in this case the three exons now the last thing I want to talk about is something called and I just want to briefly mention it not going into great detail is something called RNA editing and this is one of those things that also kind of makes um, uh, thro throws a wrench into the clogs of the central dogma because what it does is it takes this mature messenger RNA that's been modified with the G cap at the poly tails added and introns removed and so it should be all ready to make a very specific protein that this DNA encoded but RNA editing comes along and specific RNAs bind to it and these these are called guide RNAs G-U-I-D-E and they bind to the messenger RNA and they produce a very similar RNA as we had before still with the G cap still with the poly A tail still with these three exons but very slight nucleotide changes have occurred which changes the ultimate protein that will be produced this finding was, was revolutionary when it was discovered because it indicated an alternative method that proteins could be made independent of the genome much in the same way that epigenetics is providing a, an alternative for which proteins are being ultimately made in the cell now I wanted to end with a quick discussion on the levels of gene regulation and the purpose of this really 
is to illustrate the complexity of gene regulation. As we begin to think about gene regulations at the level of epigenetics, it's important to think about the larger picture. That ultimately the goal is to make a protein or not to make a protein. And how do we do that? So I want to draw the nucleus here. And I'll draw a piece of DNA in here. And this DNA is transcribed into RNA. And this RNA is modified. This RNA then is exported from the nucleus. Now it's in the cytoplasm. This RNA is then translated to make a protein. Often this protein is modified to make an active protein. And then ultimately this protein is degraded back to its original amino acids. At each of these steps of going from DNA to the end of the protein, regulation occurs. So going from gene to protein is a very complex process that involves many, many steps. And at each of these steps, the regulation of that gene is under high scrutiny and is regulated um, very specifically. And again, this is very important. It's a lot of energy to make this protein. And so before the cell decides to invest that kind of energy to make a protein, it wants to make sure it's making that protein at the right time and in the right cell. Okay, I'd like to end now with a summary of what we've talked about in this series of discussions on transcription. We covered some basic terms of transcription. We drew the structure of the gene, identifying the important parts, the open reading frame, the promoters, the terminators, these distal regions where in, that are called enhancer and silencer sequences. We talked about the need for specificity and how that is controlled by the transcription factor. We talked about the stages of transcription. We talked about RNA polymerases, the different kinds of RNAs. We set the stage for transcription. Then we spent quite a bit of time talking about this pre-initiation complex and how it was set up, the order, and I don't know if I stress this enough, but that order of when those proteins come to the promoter has to be tightly followed. So we talked about all kinds of these general transcription factors. and how they set up this massive complex, and then how that was stimulated for initiation. We then spent a, a little bit of time talking about RNA modification, and how that transcript, that initial mRNA that was made from that gene, how it wasn't quite ready to leave the nucleus how we had to add the G cap, the poly A tail, splice out those introns, and how there was even an additional step of that, that allowed for change using RNA editing. We then finished with a general schematic of gene regulation. How a gene, because of this need for specificity, how it can be regulated at multiple steps during the process of going from gene to protein to ultimately small peptides and amino acids. And throughout this whole process, we're gonna focus in this class on that early initiation, that regulation gets the ball going. All right, that ends what I wanna talk about in uh, these podcasts. And if you have any questions at all, please make sure you see me. If not, I'll see you in class.